Well, usually a cold case file starts with a victim. And investigators are stumped piecing together what happened, then finding a perpetrator. But in the case of Samuel Little, dubbed America's most prolific serial killer, it's the exact opposite. He confessed to killing 93 women, 93. Federal investigators have spent years trying to find the victims he allegedly killed. Now they are releasing new information in the hopes of jogging the public's memory and solving the last 31 cold cases. Investigators asking for your help tonight in cracking a cold case, identifying the remaining victims of the man called America's most prolific serial killer. Samuel Little died nearly a year ago while serving a life sentence in California, his rap sheet dating back to the 60s. In 2018, Little drew pictures of his victims from memory, confessing to 93 killings between 1970 and 2005. Oh man, I love this. The FBI says Little reliably remembered details about his victims, like transgender Mary Ann, whom he met at a Miami bar called the Pool Palace in approximately 1971 or 72. She weighed about 135, okay. one, maybe 140. And how old do you think she was? Like she was 19. And around 1982, when he said he killed a woman in her 30s whom he met in a New Orleans nightclub. Her and her sister was two, she had her two sisters. Her and her, two, her, her youngest sister was having a birthday party. The confessions leaving police in the rare situation of already having the killer, but only sketches of dozens of alleged victims spanning 35 years, many whose bodies have never been found. So we're still working to try to identify the victim, um, but it's, as you imagine, that far back, everything's kind of paper records, nothing's digital, so it's, it's all sort of labor and man hours to do it. Little said he usually targeted prostitutes and drug addicts. They often were not from the local area and were less likely to be missed. We don't know where these victims were born, where they're raised. Investigators now hoping the new details will shake loose a memory and maybe an identification to bring closure to the families. You know, we would love to find a better way to notify them, but we don't have it. This is all we have. I'd want to know at the end what, what happened to my child. All right, Karen Binder is a forensic genealogist with the DNA Dope Project. Karen joins us live now. Karen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, well, Samuel Little is deceased at this point. You know, they say if a case isn't solved in the first 48 hours, it becomes more difficult. So how do teams go about trying to identify these remaining victims, bring some type of closure for families after decades? I think the challenge with this case is really matching the victims to the killer. Um, this killer, you know, identified a lot of victims uh, through portraits and stories and illustrations. So um, what would perhaps need to be done is matching those to existing John and Jane Doe's remains that have already been found and identifying those remains through DNA. All right. So, so Karen, what are some of the biggest challenges really in trying to identify those victims? As you said, they are drawings. And I mean, in my estimation, that's difficult enough. We're taking a look at these. How do you go from these drawings to finding real people? Well, currently um, there are, you know, tens of thousands of John and Jane Doe's in um, databases throughout the United States. So NamUs being the largest one, probably some of these victims could be matched to those remains, those unidentified remains. The challenge with identifying uh, remains from uh, John and Jane Doe's, you know, it has to do with whether um, they're well represented in the DNA databases that we use. So for some of these victims, he provided first names um, and more information but uh, those would need to be matched to existing John and Jane Doe's. And how long do you think this process will take? Or how does this process even work? Is the matching just, is a computer just constantly running the, the DNA, the, the names? How does that work? Some of it is an automated process, but some of it is manually submitted. So users can actually create um, a user account on NamUs and try to match victims to missing people. So that's one way that the public can actually help with cases like this. And, you know, he admitted to more than 90 murders. Do you think that a killer could get away with something like that, you know, given today's advances in forensic technology, you know, with DNA. Could this happen, do you think, today? 
I think it, it still could um, only because, uh, you know, as, as much as we have the technology to identify many, many people, there are still, um, it's still very difficult to solve a case like this. And there are also populations that are underrepresented in the databases that we use. So um, while it would probably be less likely for him to get away with something like that today, um, you know, we can't be 100%. We always have to, you know, watch out for things like that. And I do have one last question for you, Karen. You know, we see this situation and it, it seems nearly impossible, but you know, you do work with the DNA Doe Project and matches do happen, victims are identified. Yes, most definitely. And um, and these days, people are more likely to report their loved ones missing. Um, back in the time that uh, Samuel Little was operating, uh, you know, not only were people not always reported missing, but we didn't have the computers and um, recorded data that we have today. So thankfully, these days, there's a lot more attention on missing persons cases. Absolutely. All right. Karen Binder with the DNA Doe Project. We thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.